there's an equals function which defines identity. And that code has to compile and run, right? And so the software engineer is not going to get deeply philosophical about the nature of identity and whether you know, object ship A is the same as ship B. They are going to write that code uh, and just get on with their lives, right? And so they are doing philosophy, right? All of our, our software, I would wager everyone here working on software is working on software that models the world in some way, right? We are building models, whether it's in your data structures, whether it's in your database schemas, you are actually modeling some aspect of the world to manipulate it. Uh, and so you're making all sorts of philosophical decisions about that, um, even if you're not really thinking about it as being a philosophical kind of thing. Um, so I'm not really here to talk in general about the philosophy of software engineering. Uh, I'm here more specifically to talk about philosophy around incidents. Uh, and so here's a fellow who is looking at a system that is on fire. Uh, and that this person has a model in their head about how the world works, about how, how reality is. And their model of reality in their heads shapes the way they perceive the world, right? So we don't actually perceive the world directly. Our, our perceptions are mediated through our models of how the world is, right? Through our prior beliefs about like how the world actually operates. And so I have tried to represent this here that the, their mental model acts as a kind of filter and that they don't see that system on fire directly. They see it mediated through their mental model that they, they've built up over time. Uh, and so I want to talk about two aspects, two philosophical aspects around uh, incidents. One of them is about the nature of, of causality, right? Like, like why do incidents, right? why do bad incidents happen to good engineers? Uh, and, and one model of causality is, is the linear model of causality, right? That, you know, event A happens and that causes event B to happen and that causes event C to happen, right? And um, if you think about the five whys, it really assumes a linear causal model, right? Why did C happen? Because of B. Why did B happen? It was because of A, right? So that's a model of causality that a lot of people carry around in their heads around incidents. So when someone asks, you know, what was the root cause, like underlying that question is a model in their head about how incidents happen. The other philosophical aspect I'm gonna talk about here, the second one, is this notion of ontology. Uh, and so one, one metaphor that I really like for what, what ontology is, so ontology is about sort of like the nature of reality, what's in reality. Uh, and there's this metaphor that the ontology is the furniture of the world. It is the things that you believe that the world is made up of, right? So you can go and you can, you know, point to a chair or a table, right? And those are things that are part of your ontology, right? So if it's there, you can sort of believe in it, you see it, uh, and if it's not in your ontology, you won't even notice it or, or think about it. So when someone asks after an incident, okay, like which was the service that broke, right? That is uh, an indication that services are part of their ontology, right? That's part of their furniture of the world that they, you know, hold in their heads about incidents. Uh, so there's this great, this is the only quote I'll ha I have here. Um, so there's a great quote by the researcher Carl Week, who did work on sense making. And he basically said that one of the things that's, that's critical to understanding sense making is that people see things that they believe in uh, and things that they don't have beliefs about, they're just not going to see those things, right? And so if you don't believe something, you don't have, if it's not in your ontology, you're not going to see it after an incident as being part of that incident. All right, so I come along to someone who has, you know, a, a you know, linear causality model, a certain ontology that has, you know, a bunch of services and stuff. And I say, hey, look, I've got a better model for you about how incidents happen. It's a, it's a we're going to get more insights out of this model. And my model has, instead of like, you know, arrows going one after the other, they have a whole bunch of arrows that are going in parallel that are converging. And there's like, they go sort of backwards in time and there's a whole kind of hairball thing going on. Uh, and it really, like, it's, it's my, my model is great. Like, it's better than yours, right? <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Uh, so my causality model, instead of having, like, causes, linear causes, it has multiple contributing factors. These are great. 
my, my ontology has like interactions, like not just problems with individual services, but it's like interaction patterns between services that are part of an incident. My, my ontology also has history. It's not just like, okay, like a bug got pushed, but there's all this stuff that happened before, all, this, all these decisions that were made by people who are probably not even at the company anymore further back in time that have sort of like laid the foundation for certain things to happen. Those are in my ontology of, of incidents. Uh, local rationality is in my ontology, right? My ontology has this notion that people make decisions locally based on this information that they have, right? So, that, so when someone makes a decision, they're making a rational decision based on what they know. They, they probably don't know everything that's going on in the whole world, but they have some view of the world, and we need to understand that view to understand how incidents happen. So that's a concept of local rationality that is in my ontology. Uh, uncertainty is in my ontology, right? Like when an incident happens, we don't know what's going on, right? And that, that plays a role in how people, you know, act, how they, you know, diagnose what's going on and remediate. That's, that's in my ontology of incidents. Uh, goal conflicts are in my ontology of incidents, right? People have to, they're asked to go quickly, but they're also asked to go safely, and so they're, they're constrained in, in multiple ways, and that sh shapes the way they make decisions, right? So goal conflicts, those are in my ontology of incidents. These are great. Uh, Production pressure feeds into goal conflicts, right? This is in my ontology. People have to feel pressured by the organization to move more quickly. You gotta get that feature out. You gotta hit that deadline. Uh, that affects the way people make decisions, how they work. Um, you need to see that to understand incidents. It's, it's in my ontology. Now, workarounds are in my ontology. People don't work the way you think they do. They, they work differently and they are they work differently because they're constrained by certain things. Maybe like your UX is terrible on your tools and so they have to do things differently in order to get their work done. And you gotta see those workarounds to, to really understand the incident. Those are in my ontology. Expertise is in my ontology, right? Like some incidents get resolved very quickly uh, and, and you're not gonna understand how those get remediated and other ones take longer unless you're able to see the role of expertise that it plays in, in those incidents and even in, in preventing certain incidents. Um, so it's in my ontology. Uh, last one, coordination. Coordination is in my ontology. Like it's hard for different people to coordinate in order to get work done and that, that's true during incidents and it's also true in advance and all, often, you know, person A did something person B didn't know about and that contributes and that's a coordination issue and you need to be able to see that that challenge of coordination in order to understand how incidents happen. So these are all the stuff that are in my ontology that I, I, am, I am proposing. Uh, and I say, here's my, here's my model. Uh, and the response I get is, all right, no, I, I'm good, uh, really. Like, you know, my model's fine. I understand how incidents happen. Yours is kind of a weird hairball thing. I, I don't really want, want to deal with it. Um, and so like this, this doesn't literally happen because I don't literally present a model explicitly like this to like, you know, download out of my head and upload into someone else's. But in practice, I find this is what happens if I just go and walk up to someone and say, hey, you know, you should think about incidents differently. You should, you should add all this stuff to your ontology. You should have a different causality model. Uh, and I wanna say uh, one thing about engineers and one thing about leadership. And one thing is that like action items are, are really salient in the ontology of engineers. And it's a reasonable thing because like engineers' job is to solve problems. And the way you solve problems is you do things and, and action items are things that you do, right? And so it is not an easy, like you're not gonna be able to like get that out of their thing. Um, I don't want them to focus as much on action items when we don't understand the problem fully. Um, but like that is fundamental to the nature of engineering uh, and you have to understand that because that's sort of what you're up against. The other thing is leadership, like, when leadership looks at the organization and their ontology, like they see the org chart, right? This is how they understand their system. And so they're gonna ask questions like, okay, like which, you know, who owns that service? Like which, which you know, teams are in trouble that need more resources, right? Like this is how they view the world. Uh, and fundamentally, I don't think you can change the way they view it in terms of the org chart. That's always gonna be there. That's, that's kind of their job. All right, so that I think is sort of the, the problem that I, I'm posing, at least what I have personally experienced when I've tried to get people to, to see things differently. So um, I have to offer some solutions, right? Uh, so here is, is what I'm proposing. Uh, I hope these work, I'm trying these out. Uh, maybe you know, in a year you'll know whether I'm successful or not. Um, but this is what I'm claiming we can try to do. Um, so one thing I'm sure many people have heard in other contexts is the idea of show, don't tell. 
right? There's one thing to say, okay, you should really look at you know, interactions between services in general. It's another thing to say, look at this particular incident, like inc one, two, three, four, like look what happened between service A and service B. Like we need to argue, I believe, from the specific instances of data, right? Like we, we should be making our arguments if we want people to understand incidents differently, we should argue from specific incidents that have happened in the organization rather than argue at an abstract level. I don't, I don't think it will work to argue at an abstract level. I think we need to show people. Oh. And man, we gotta keep doing it. Uh, you can't just do it once, right? Like, it's not gonna sink in if you just do it once. Like, people need to see it over and over and over again for it to sink in. And also, like, there's turnover. Uh, in your organization, so new people will come in. And so you have to keep over and over and over bringing these things home and introducing like, these new things into their ontology by pointing them out explicitly in incidents that are going on, by, by you know, proposing the different causality model you know, with respect to specific incidents that are happening. Uh, I think uh, there's actually, I don't think I've heard a single talk today really about language, uh, which is interesting because like, in general, the like safety two-ish folks love to talk about language. Uh, I love to talk about language personally. Um, you know, my handle is no root cause. In the Slack at my work, the no root cause Slack emoji is like my avatar, uh, right? Uh, but I think it's not enough to just say like, don't say no root cause or, or don't say human error. So for example, I've seen people, when I'm in a room, say the root cause was, oh, I mean the primary factor was blah, right? And I'm like, <laughs> Well, you're just substituting the, you know, one term for another. Uh, I'm still personally very deliberate with my language, right? I don't like to talk about causes. I don't like to talk about error. Um, but I think it's not enough to just sort of like enforce a, uh, you know, a, a, I don't know, a change in language like that. I don't think anyone's really explicitly proposing this. Um, but I, I've seen this effect where people just sort of change the language without actually like changing the way they think about how things happen. Um, I don't know if engineers in particular enjoy arguing or everyone enjoys arguing and I'm just familiar with engineers, but <laughs> engineers seem to enjoy arguing a lot. Um, and if you, <laughs> thank you. And if you tell someone effectively that their like, understanding of the nature of reality is wrong, they're gonna, an engineer is gonna argue with you uh, and they're gonna like, get entrenched in their position and I don't, I've never seen a, like a constructive outcome there personally. Like I've never argued someone into like getting into my, my way of thinking about like the complex nature of incidents. So like I think that if you're arguing with someone, forget it, like that's not the way you're gonna convince them. Uh, it's, it's not a good use of your time. Uh, if you enjoy it, you know, go for it, but don't, I don't think it'll change, personally don't think it'll change minds. So I'm trying a, a different approach like a yes and approach like they use in, in improv. Uh, so, you know, in the, in the work that I do, there are people who ask for, you know, what I would consider shallow metrics. I don't think there's gonna be much ROI in doing that work. Um, you know, I can voice internally, I, I don't think there's gonna be much value in doing this. Uh, and then like, no, we're doing it anyways, Lauren. Okay, so I would say yes, okay, let's, we're gonna do it. But I also wanna do my sort of qualitative approach and let's do both and let's see what happens, right? Let's do a bake-off. Uh, and a bake-off, this actually seems to work really well because if you say someone to someone, okay, I think you're wrong, let's test it. Let's see if you're actually right. They're like, yeah, I think I'm right. Let's do, it. Let's do them both because they, they think they're going to be right there. Uh, and so I see much less um, back pressure on like, doing it two different ways. One way I don't think will be particularly productive in my own way rather than just trying to fight and just do it my way. Um, so I'll tell you how it goes. I have a lot of confidence that my way will be correct. Uh, but we will see. We'll see who gets the better, better insights at the end of the day. Uh, I try very hard to get people to have discussions that are around outcomes rather than around a particular approach. So it's one thing for someone to say, I want like, some kind of like traffic light metric. I want some like, goodness metric around like, how this team is doing. This one is 12. This one is 18 or whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, what do we actually want to accomplish there, right? Like you don't, like a number itself is not useful, right? Like what are you trying to do? And ultimately, one thing I, I try to steer conversations around is the idea of risk. Because I think like whether you are like an LFI-ish systems complex person or a you know, traditional MTT star person, uh, 
like everyone sort of thinks about availability at, in terms of risk and like, okay, I'm worried about a big outage that's gonna happen. I, me in particular, I'm like, what we should be worried about is a very large, very complex outage that takes like hours to resolve, you know, affects a huge amount of the customers. Like that's what I am concerned with. And I think like trying to get alignment on like, okay, the problem we're trying to solve is understanding risk so that we can put controls in place, we can add capacity to absorb it. Like that's where I want the conversation to go because I find when some people are like asking for metrics, they may not have like really thought through exactly what they want out of it. Um, but they will agree that like, yeah, like I wanna make decisions around risk. Um, so I would say talking about risk is a winner. People like talking about risk. Um, they don't argue about it as much. Uh, there was an entire talk today, at least one, I think multiple actually, about patterns. Um, so David Woods did my work for me here. Um, so hopefully you saw his talk on identifying meaningful patterns. Um, Alex Elmans and Sarah Butt's talk also touched on this on thematic analysis, if you caught that here uh, in this room. Uh, so I'm not gonna say much more about the importance of patterns, other than just to note that like, it's, it's actually really hard to do, I find, to identify meaningful patterns from like a, a corpus of incidents. Uh, one of the reasons that it's hard is that it's, it's really easy to do poorly. Like if you want to set up categories, put things into buckets and then count those buckets, like, yeah, you can do that. I, I don't think you're going to get anything interesting out of it. That's why I'm standing here. Um, but if you're going to look like in detail at a bunch of incidents and try to identify themes, that's, that's hard work. It's work most of us are not trained to do. Um, we never get to watch experts doing it, right? Like I cannot go and watch someone at another organization say who's done as well. I don't have access to their, their corpus. Like they cannot publish it uh, because all the good stuff is internal, right? So it's hard to do and we don't get to see it done well uh, in action. And so I think it's gonna be sort of like a grand challenge of our field uh, is to be able to get better at individual companies at identifying meaningful patterns across the, the collection of incidents that we see. All right, I'm gonna, you know, the third part of my talk, I'm gonna end off talking about why I think we have an advantage over the like MTT star crowd uh, around, around uh, doing, getting insights, better insights out of uh, sort of qualitative LFI-ish analysis. Uh, so one, uh, I used to worry a lot uh, that, oh no, there's an interesting incident, and it went by, I didn't have time to look at it. Uh, damn, like it's gone. Uh, but you know what, <laughs> there's always another one just around the corner, right? Like one problem that we do not have is that we are never going to run out of incidents. And like, we do not have this goal of being like 100% complete in our sampling in the way that other people try to do. Uh, so like, don't worry, like you miss an incident, I promise you, there are more coming. We, you, we will always have more, more data to work with. One is that like you get like insights like right away, right? Like if you do, like a, like a qualitative, like systems -y based look at, a, at like one incident, already you will learn like a ton of stuff, right? Whereas like if you just get like a number out of it, well, like what does that mean? What, what is the insight there? Uh, and so like whenever I, I like look at like qualitative detail at, at an individual incidents, like I get stuff right away. And so that you get like positive feedback immediately. And I find that's like super tangible and useful. Um, I talked about arguing before. One thing I absolutely cannot stand is people arguing over which bucket to put an incident in when they have like a pre-existing set of categories, right? Like, is this of type A or is this of type B? Is this assigned to like team foo or team bar? I think that those kinds of discussions, they have like, like zero value to the organization. Like you are just like flushing engineering time down the toilet having those discussions. Um, when we do like sort of the qualitative approaches that we do, we don't have those arguments ever, right? You, you never, cause you're not, like those arguments are a symptom of the fact that they are throwing away useful information, right? And they're trying to figure out what should they throw out, right? Where like the approach that we are trying to take here is like, let's identify all the useful information and focus on that rather than try to compress it based on some preexisting categories. Um, so we don't have those arguments and, and I think that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and finally, wow, I'm, I'm very ahead of time here. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, man, I, I don't know about you, but like, I just love this stuff. Like, like when, you, when you look at instance like this, you, you get an understanding of, like, of the nature of reality and complex systems and how they work well and, and how they, they break, and you start to see it 
like everywhere, not just like at the incidents that are happening in your existing company or when you read incident re you know reviews from like other places. But you you see it all over the place, and you can apply it everywhere, um, and you just get a better appreciation of, of how you know reality really works. And I I found that to be a very like addictive kind of thing, uh, and so I think like. While it may be difficult to push through at organizations when they don't believe in this stuff, like there's like intrinsic motivation I find this work creates to, to keep going forward. Uh, and that's what's kept me at it after all this time. All right. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.